Well, good morning. Welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for joining us online as well. We are going to begin a brand new series today called 50 Days of Hope. And where we're getting this from is the 50 days that Jesus spent on earth after the resurrection. Actually, 40 days he spent here. And then uh, he told the disciples to wait until the Holy Spirit came, which uh, meant that they waited 10 days. And so there's 50 days between the resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit and the start of the church. And so we're going to be looking at those 50 days and how they bring us hope and what they mean to the Christian. What Jesus did during that time gives us hope. What Jesus did during that time changed the world. Now, have you ever wondered why did Jesus wait 40 days and then uh, told the disciples to wait for 10 days before the church started? Why didn't he just go right to heaven and start the church immediately? Why did he wait around 40 days before he ascended back to heaven? You ever thought about that? Some of you may not even have known that there was 40 days between uh, when Jesus resurrected and we went back to heaven. And then, of course, there were those 10 days after he ascended to heaven uh, until that the Holy Spirit came and the church started. Why did he do that? Well, there are some wonderful lessons that I believe that he uh, teaches us. And if you'd like to read about those 50 days, and I would encourage you to do it, read the last chapter of Matthew, Mark, Luke, the last two chapters of John, and the first chapter of Acts. That covers those 50 days. So the last chapter of Matthew, Mark, Luke, the last two chapters of John, and the first chapter of the book of Acts. That's the Gospels in the book of Acts. So if you will read that, you'll read about those 50 days. And I believe that Jesus did it to teach us some things. And that's what this sermon series is about. We're going to be looking at the hope that Jesus gave us. Now, I would say that as a world, that as a nation, we need hope. Maybe more than ever, we need hope. Maybe more than ever in our lifetime, we need hope. And Jesus gives us that hope. And so I'm very excited about what we're going to learn. We're going to be talking about over the next uh, seven Sundays... We're going to be talking about some of the lessons that Jesus taught his disciples and thus taught us uh, during that time. Things like, what do we learn from waiting? What do we learn from waiting? I'm going to talk about that one Sunday. Let me ask you a question. Do you like to wait? I don't like to wait on anything. I don't like to wait in line if I'm at Six Flags. If I'm at Six Flags, I've lost my mind and go to Six Flags. I used to love going and riding roller coasters. Now I'm kind of like, eh, I can do without that at my age. But uh, I I hated waiting. Or maybe you like waiting down at the DMV. Anybody like that? Uh, Kim and I moved recently, and uh, we moved to another county, and we had to go get our license uh, tags changed and our license changed and all this stuff. And man, did God teach me patience and all the waiting that I had to do. I don't like to wait. I don't like to wait on anything. I don't like for things, I don't like to wait for things to heat up. Just put it in the microwave and you get it done, right? Well, there are some valuable lessons that we learn in waiting. What does God do for you when you learn to wait? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what Jesus wants us to see in people. Next Sunday, I'm going to talk about that Jesus came to help us see. What did he come to help us see? He came to help us see people differently, ourselves differently. We're going to look at that next week. Jesus uh, taught us uh, how to deal with our unbelief. Did you know that even after the resurrection of Jesus, you read those last chapters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, last two chapters of John, first chapter of Acts, you'll find that the disciples that had literally seen Jesus resurrected, they had literally touched him. They still doubted. Did you know that? What does Jesus want to teach us? He wants to teach us to deal with our unbelief, how to deal with our doubts. Uh, What does God teach us about reading the Bible? We're going to look at that. So there are a lot of things we're going to talk about, and so I hope you'll be here uh, for the next seven Sundays. Now, the text that I'm going to read today, I want to set it up so that you'll understand what we're reading. 
Uh, what we're reading today is what is known as the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Now, Jesus, before this, gave us the Great Commandment. So we have the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. What is the Great Commandment? Well, you remember that someone asked him what is the greatest commandment. Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, we are to love God with our mind, with our decisions, with our actions, and with our emotions, every part of us. That's the great commandment. And then the great commission is to take the good news of Jesus to all the world. That's loving people. So Jesus said you could sum up everything in the Bible on these two thoughts. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. And so we're going to be looking at that. And so the Great Commission is what we're going to be reading today. Now, you need to understand that this was the very last day that Jesus was on earth before he ascended back to heaven. And we know that from comparing different passages in the gospel. And these were, we don't know if these were the very last words that Jesus spoke, but they were among the last words that Jesus spoke. Now, how many of you know that the last thing you say is the most important thing you say. When I left to go to college, my mom and my dad said some things to me that were very important. They reminded me who I was. They reminded me that I was their son. They reminded me that I was representing our family name. They had some very important things to say to me. If you send your kids off to camp, you say some very important things uh, to them. If they go away to summer camp, you want them to actually take a bath or take a shower while they're gone. That's very important. You got that, especially boys. That's the last thing you got to say. First time I ever went to camp, I did not take a, a shower the entire week of camp. And the reason I did not, number one, I didn't want to. Uh, number two, I went swimming every day and I considered that a bath. Now, I would take my clothes, my wet clothes that I swam in, and put them in my suitcase with my clean clothes, and it's hot during the summer, and I was a, I thought I was a genius because I was not having to clean up anything that way. I just put everything in that suitcase, and by the end of that week, you can imagine how foul I smelled and all my clothes smelled. When my mom picked me up, she opened the suitcase, and I'm not sure, but I think she may have just thrown everything away, just right into the garbage because it smelled so bad. The last thing you say is important. It's something you want people to remember. It's the priority. And so what we're going to see today was Jesus, in the last things that he said to his disciples, he said something very, very important. So today, I want to talk to you on this thought. Jesus came to give us hope. Jesus came to give us hope. And we're going to see the hope of the world here in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Just three verses. Let's read them together. The Bible says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go back to that, those two little words, all authority. Authority. All authority. All authority in heaven and earth. All authority. How much authority? All authority. Say it with me. All authority. Say it one more time. All authority. Now pretend that you're awake and say it with me actually and actually let the words come out of your mouth where I can hear you. Ready? All authority. Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and earth. Not just some. He's sovereign. He's over all. He's in charge. Therefore, because of this authority, he said, because I have all power, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I want to give you just four thoughts from this text today that will help us 
learn how that we can have hope, how that we can discover the hope that Jesus gives to each of us, what he promises us and how he promises to be with us. The first thought is this, hope comes from the power of Jesus. Not my power, not the government's power, not the power of your bank account or your buying power, not from the power of your job, not from the power of your reputation, but the authority and the power of Jesus Christ himself. Have you ever wondered when it says, Jesus said, I've been given all authority in heaven and earth, what he has authority over? I want you to think about this. He's been given authority over sin. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He is faithful and just. Aren't you glad that God is faithful? Aren't you glad, glad that God never lets us down? Aren't you glad that God never quits on us? Aren't you glad that God is the God of second chances and third chances and 100th chances? He is faithful and he's just or he's righteous so that he will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now the idea here is that God in his faithfulness will forgive us when we come to him and we confess. When we say to him and admit to him that we have sinned, that we need him. He is faithful and he is just and he cleanses us. In other words, he justifies us. He puts us in right standing with the Father. He makes it as if we had never sinned. So that when the heavenly Father sees us, he does not see our righteousness or our sin or our unrighteousness, but rather he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus has authority over sin. But I want you to understand this, not just in forgiveness, but he has authority over sin and how it has control over your life. Listen to what it says in Romans 6, 14. Sin is no longer your master. Sin is no longer your master. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand because everybody is guilty and would have to raise their hand, but has there ever been a sin that just kicks your butt? Has there ever been a sin that you say, God, I'm sorry, I don't want to do this anymore, and before you know it, you do it again? Has there ever been a sin that you've confessed to God and said, you know what, I'm not going to do this anymore, and somehow or another, you find yourself doing it again and again and again? I want you to know what Jesus promised us. He said, sin is no longer your master. Sin is no longer in control of your life. Sin is no longer your master. Then he says this, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. In other words, he was describing to us the idea of having to be made right with God by our own actions, by our own effort, by our own discipline, by our own good. Now, the Bible's not against being good. It just says you can't be good enough to be made right with God. The Bible's certainly not against discipline. Uh, you should be disciplined. The Bible tells us that it is the Holy Spirit that gives us discipline, that God is the one that gives us the power to do these things. So he says, you are no longer under the requirements of the law. You don't have to earn your way to God, but rather, instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. What is God's grace? It is his unearned, unmerited, undeserved kindness and favor. Backstage this morning before the service, we shared uh, from Psalm 107, I believe it was, and it says that his mercy endures forever. The counterpart to God's grace is God's mercy. God's grace is that we don't get uh, what we deserve. In other words, we get what we don't deserve. It's unearned, unmerited, and undeserved. But mercy is that he doesn't give us what we do deserve, which is judgment and punishment and separation from God. But aren't you glad that God gives us mercy? Jesus has power over sin. He also has authority over life. Listen to the words of Jesus. John 14, 6. 
And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Now, I want you to notice something interesting about this verse. Uh, For you English majors or English teachers, you'll appreciate this. Jesus used in his words there a definite article in front of the three words that he described himself. I am the way, not a way, the way. I am the truth, not a truth, the truth. I am the life, not a life, not a way to live, but the life. Life. Have you ever pondered the fact that Jesus has power over life? Jesus has power in our lives. He is the way. He's the way to the Father. He is the road to take. He is the way to heaven. He is the way to live. There are so many people that are searching for purpose and meaning in life. They try to find happiness in so many different things. And often they find or seek to find happiness in things that are never intended to give happiness. They try to put their significance in things that cannot bring significance. But Jesus said, I am the way. The way. I am the truth. Are you a truth seeker? Are you seeking for what's right? Everybody I know at some point in their life seeks truth. They want to know what is true. Even the atheists, they're seeking for what's true. They're seeking for meaning. They're seeking for something that makes sense. And Jesus said, I am the truth. Not a truth, but I am the absolute definite thing. Are you seeking for meaning in life? It's found through Jesus. It's not found through your work. Should your work be meaningful? Yeah. I hope you do have a meaningful job. I hope you do find satisfaction and fulfillment in what you do. But the true ultimate satisfaction is not found in what you do. That's not who you are. That is what you do But it is not who you are. Who you are is when you become a follower of Jesus, you're a child of God. The way, the truth, and the life. You ever wondered how some people don't seem to have as much as others in the way of material things, and yet it seems like their life is so satisfying, so fulfilling? I met a man in Jacksonville, Florida, the church I worked in, Uh, many years ago, now over 26 years ago. I was a youth pastor at this church, and his son was in our youth department. And I'll never forget, his name was Mr. Scott. And Mr. Scott had eight children. And uh, he was just a working man, and he never was a wealthy man. But I'll never forget, I went over to his house one day, and uh, he, he said to me, he said, son, I want you to look at my house. And he lived in a very small, plain house. It was I mean, it was clean, but it wasn't anything fancy. He said, I want you to look at my house. So I said, okay. I looked at his house. He said, I want you to look at my car. And he drove an old beat-up pickup truck. So I looked at his car. He said, what do you see? I said, well, I see a house and I see a car. And he said, what do you see when you look at me? And I didn't know what to say to that. I, I had no clue where he was going with it. I said, I don't know. I see a man. He said, no, no, no. You see, when you look at me, the richest man in the world. I said, what in the world are you talking about? You're not the richest man in the world. He said, oh, yes, I am. He said, because a man that is truly rich lacks for nothing. He wants nothing. He has everything that he wants. And he said, you're looking at the richest man in the world, not because of what I own, but because of who owns me, because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you this question. Wouldn't you like to be a part of that? Wouldn't you like to have some of that instead of always being dissatisfied always chasing the almighty dollar. Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting you should quit your job. And I'm certainly not suggesting that there's anything wrong with having nice things. But there's everything wrong with nice things having you. And so what God wants us to realize is that Jesus is the life. All power comes from him. He has power over life. He has power over sin. He has power over death. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. 
We live in a time, especially now, where people are terrified. They're afraid that they'll get COVID-19 and die. You know, there certainly have been a lot of people that have had this terrible disease or whatever you would call it, this pandemic. But I want you to know something. The Bible tells us that Jesus has power over death. Now, does that mean that he has the ability to deliver us from death if we get sick? Oh, absolutely it does. But I, I want you to understand something. Jesus will deliver every believer from death no matter what. You say, wait a minute, are you saying that if I got sick that I'm not going to die? That's not what I said. Ultimately, he will deliver you from death because ultimately you're going to die in this physical body one day no matter how healthy you are, no matter how many times Jesus heals you, no matter what you eat, no matter how you live. Maybe you've never smoked a day in your life. Maybe you've never drank a day in your life. Uh, maybe you've lived a clean life and you think you're going to live a really, really long time. Heard about one guy that was sitting on the front porch and he was very old and decrepit looking. I mean, he looked like he was ancient. And there's this young guy that was walking by and he saw this old, old, decrepit looking man. He said, sir, I must ask you, to what do you attribute the way you look to your old age? How is it that you've lived like you've lived as long as you have lived? The old looking man looked down and he said, son, I smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. I drink a pint of whiskey every day of my life. And I've chased women ever since I've been old enough to do it. The young man looked at him and said, well, my goodness. He said, how old are you, sir? He said, I'm 27 years old. So <laughs> Jesus has power over death. And he has power over life. And then he has power over deliverance. Psalm 18, 2 says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer. I got good news for you, that if you'll trust him, he will deliver you. And look, I have compassion toward people that struggle with addictions. I really do. But I really do believe that Jesus is more powerful than your addiction. If you have a habit then you need to learn to trust Jesus. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be disciplined or follow a program. Those are wonderful things. And they have their place. But do you know who has power to deliver you? It's Jesus. Jesus. You say, well, you know, I, I, I smoke and I want to quit. Um, and I really, really have tried and I just can't do it. Well, I've had some people ask me, Pastor, is smoking a sin? Is smoking, will smoking send you to hell? And I look at them and I say, no. Just makes you smell like you've been there. But other than that, it's fine, you know. But no, if it's a, a habit like smoking, nothing sinful about it. But the fact is, if it's a habit you want to quit, you can trust Jesus to be your deliverer. He can deliver you. Uh, you, you say, well, uh, I've got a hang-up in my life. I've been hurt. And Jesus can deliver you from your hurts. Maybe you've been abused. Maybe you've been abandoned. Maybe there's bitterness in your heart because of it. And Jesus can deliver you from your hurts. He can deliver you from your hang-ups. He can deliver you from your habits. He can deliver you from your sins. Why? Because Jesus is our deliverer. He has power over deliverance. He has power over people. John 17, 2. For you gave him authority over all humanity. Did you know that all people eventually will bow the knee to Jesus? It doesn't mean that all people are going to be saved and go to heaven. The Bible tells us that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That does not mean that everyone will do it in this life. As long as you're drawing breath, it's not too late. As long as you're drawing breath in this life, you still have time. But I want you to know that there will be a day, even the atheist, even the total rebel, even the person that hates God, every one of us will eventually bow the knee. Jesus has power over people. He has power over heaven. He has power over hell. He has power over the nations. 1 Peter 3 22, Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. 
what we can say about him is that he is sovereign. He has all authority. He has all power. He has power over creation. Colossians 1.17, he existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Let me just say this for those of you that are so worried about climate change, or you're so worried about what is reported in the media, you're so worried about the polar ice caps and the polar bears and the, the mice that they shut down entire industries to save. Um, I do believe the Bible gives us a mandate. In the book of Genesis, it tells us that mankind has been given the mandate to care for creation. So this idea that we can just go wreck creation or that we can just pollute, uh, that's why many years ago, I, you know how I used to be? I was so thoughtless about this. I would just throw garbage out the window going down the road. It didn't matter where I was. I'd just throw it out, and I'd make jokes. Yeah, I'm creating jobs for somebody. <laughs> and uh, God convicted me about that. Because I'm like, first of all, I'm, doing, I'm, not, I'm not creating a job for somebody. I'm creating a hassle for somebody. And so God began to convict me that I have a responsibility, according to the book of Genesis, to care for God's creation. On the flip side of that, you don't have to lose your mind. You don't have to worry about how many polar bears there are. You don't have to worry about all that. You know why? Because according to Scripture... Jesus is the one that holds it all together. And I'm not saying we don't do our part. I'm not saying you throw your garbage out in the street. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you can trust him. You know why? Because he has all authority in heaven and earth. He has all authority in heaven and earth. And you don't have to worry about it. And once again, I'm not suggesting you should go pollute the planet. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying you don't have to have coffee, cigarettes, and fingernails every morning worrying about uh, the fact that you might... Uh, be in the generation where this planet ends. Trust me, you won't, according to Scripture. And I trust Scripture a lot more than I trust a newscaster. I trust Scripture a lot more than I do anybody else. And so uh, Jesus has power of creation. He has power over Satan. Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. Aren't you glad that one day God not only wins in this life, but he wins over Satan himself. He's already won, and one day he's going to cast him into the lake of fire. Thank God for that. Boy, I would clap on that one if I were you, because he sure has worked overtime to mess with us, hasn't he? Jesus has power over disease. Isaiah 53, verse 5, by his stripes we are healed. And I can say confidently that Jesus will heal every believer. So wait a minute. I, my mom was a Christian. My aunt was a Christian. And uh, they died of cancer. They didn't get healed. Yes, they did. They got healed by being taken home to be with God forever. And I guarantee you, that every believer, no matter who they are, no matter what disease they have, will ultimately be healed in heaven. Now, does Jesus heal in this life as well? Oh, absolutely, he does. But I don't get to be the one that chooses that. I don't have all authority over that. Jesus does, and he's the one. You say, well, do I, if I believe in faith, will God heal me? Well, I believe he does. Honor faith without question. But sometimes God has a greater purpose. I've shared with you before how that my sister-in-law, her name was Lisa. She died of brain cancer at age 41 years old. She was a wonderful Christian, had three children. Um, she believed that God was going to heal her, and he did. He took her home to heaven. Um, but God had a greater purpose. Her husband, my wife's brother, her older brother, had been raised in church. His dad was a deacon, but he was not a Christian. He rejected it all. In fact, he kind of, he didn't mock it necessarily, but he did with his ac actions and his attitude. And it took his wife dying to get his attention. His name is Vern. Uh, Vern got saved. Vern became a follower of Jesus Christ. He is as bold a follower of Jesus now. He took all three of their children to church, and every one of his kids now is a follower of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you this. I know that God had a greater purpose for Lisa's death, and that was to bring her entire family to Jesus. And Lisa, though she's in heaven now, if she had the chance to choose, if she had the chance to choose either living a little bit longer on this earth or dying and going to heaven early so that her family 
would come to Christ 100 times out of 100, she would choose that early death for God's greater purpose in her family's life. Now, I, I know this. I believe that God does heal in this life. I have no doubt about that. But I want you to understand that any healing that you get in this life is temporary. It's temporary at best. Because one day you're going to die. But one day you're going to be permanently healed in heaven. And so Jesus has power over disease. Let, let me give you the other thoughts. They won't be quite as long. Uh, hope rests in the person of Jesus. It rests in the power of Jesus. But it also rests in the person of Jesus. Uh, listen to Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, the beginning of the gospel of Mark. It says, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Now, understand this. Other places it says the gospel of Jesus. But Jesus was proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, I want you to understand that our hope is not found in a program. Our hope is not found in a building. Our hope is not found in our family. Our hope is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Did you know that the word gospel, it comes from a Greek word uh, that's called uh, euangelion, euangelion. And I know you didn't come here for a Greek lesson, but uh, if you break down that word, you know what the root word is? The middle of that word is uh, angel, or in Greek, angelos. And do you know that what the Bible says about Jesus, that word angel or messenger is what it means. It means that Jesus is the messenger of good news. You say, what about us when we share the gospel? We're his representatives. We're not talking about us. We're talking about him. We're just saying, you ought to go meet this guy that is the good news. Jesus is the hope of the world. And what the Bible teaches us is very clear that he is the one that is the angel. He is the one that is the messenger. He is the one that offers hope. Now, I love what Jesus said. He said, repent and believe in the gospel. He didn't say believe in good works. He didn't even say believe in baptism. He didn't say believe in the church as an institution. The church is very important. But the church is made up of a group of believers that have done nothing more than repent and believe in the gospel. That's what it's made up of. Now, I want to just kind of break down for you for a second the word repent. I grew up hearing the word repent described as or explained as turn from your actions. Turn from what you're doing and turn to God. Do you know that that is an absolute lie from hell? You say, wait a minute, what do you mean that's a lie from hell? In other words, it is a distortion of the gospel. Because the idea of turn from your actions gives the idea that you can earn it. That it's works-based. That it depends on your behavior. And the gospel does not depend on your behavior. It depends on the behavior of the Son of God. And what you and I need to learn to do is to repent. A lot of people give the word repent a bad name. When I think of the word repent, at least when I used to think of that word, I pictured a, an old evangelist that would spit on the front three rows, had a long index finger, and would point at people, and he'd wiggle that finger and say, turn or burn. But do you know what the word repent means? It means to change your thinking toward God. It means to agree with God. It doesn't mean change your behavior. You know why? Because only God can change your behavior. Only God can change your behavior. And by the way, if you truly repent and believe in the gospel, God will change your behavior. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. You're still going to sin. You're still going to fall short. You're still going to be like what we see here at Avalon Church. It's the perfect place for imperfect people. You're not going to be perfect, but it's hard for me to imagine anyone coming into proximity with the God of the universe and agreeing with him and changing your thinking toward him 
and allowing the God of the universe to come into your life and him not change you, that is totally against what Scripture teaches. And so Jesus said that hope rests in him. Our hope does not come from our possessions or the government, but from Jesus and the kingdom of God. Do you know why? That we can love one another in church, even if we're different in our political persuasions? Do you know why we can love one another, even if we have differences of opinions about things in this culture? Do you know why we can love one another? Listen closely. If we're of a different race, God forgive us for what's happening among races in this country. God forgive us for that. But the point is, and I'm going to be preaching on this soon, but the point is that hope is not found in any theory. Hope is not found in any program. It is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Did you know that the Bible does not speak of race? The Bible talks about nations and peoples and tongues. Did you know that race is a totally human construct? And I believe that it is a construct of the enemy that is meant to divide. Did you know that every person in this room, every person in this county, every person in this world comes from the same original pair, Adam and Eve? And we can be one in Jesus Christ. Do you know why there can be love in the church? Because of Jesus. Do you know why there can be racial harmony in the church? Because of Jesus. Do you know why there can be harmony in the church even if you vote differently than I do? Because of Jesus. Why? The kingdom of God is identified and defined by love. It's found in the person of Jesus. Number three, hope spreads through the purpose of Jesus. Jesus gave us his purpose here. He said, Therefore, go, because of my authority, but because of my power, go. Did you know that when he said go, it gives us two thoughts. One, it is an urgency that we've got to plan it. We've got to do this on purpose. It doesn't happen by accident. But did you know that that word go also in the Greek language could be translated this way, as you are going? So it's got to be on purpose, but it's also got to be a lifestyle. So I've got to be on purpose to invite my friends. I've got to be on purpose to tell others about Jesus. We say here at Avalon Church, inviting is evangelism. And the question is, who are you inviting? The question is, are you inviting people to the room? Or are you inviting people to watch online? Look, can I just be honest with you and bear my soul with you for a second? I'm so sick and tired of COVID-19 and all the stuff that goes along with it. I'm so tired of it. Um, and and this, is not, this, is not a, a, this is not any kind of political statement by any stretch of the imagination. But I do believe, that, yes, if you believe you should get the vaccine, get it. Okay. If you don't believe you should get a vaccine, then that's a personal decision. I support you either way. But here's what I believe. I believe our hope is found in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. And I want you to know this, that for many of us, listen closely, especially those of you watching online, for many of us, the devil has used fear to keep us from God's purpose. And what's happened is it gets so easy to say, well, I'll just watch online when you don't really watch online that much. To be honest, I'm just being honest. And it takes us out of evangelism. Well, it shouldn't. And I'm talking to every one of you online and every one of you that will stay home and watch online in the future. Listen closely. I'm asking the question, who are you inviting? When's the last time you invited somebody to come to your house and watch with you? You said, well, that would kind of defeat the purpose of me staying home because of COVID-19. Okay, invite them to watch at home online. When's the last time you did that? You see, the purpose of Jesus is is not thwarted by any human endeavor, by no government, and by no disease. The fact is, we should buy into the statement that inviting is evangelism. You see, church becomes real when you stop coming for yourself and you start coming for others. 
You want to find real purpose? You want to find real peace? You want to find real hope? You want to find real happiness? Stop coming for yourself. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't get some out of it. You shouldn't enjoy the worship. You shouldn't enjoy any of the stuff that goes along with church. You should. That's important. But stop coming for you. And start coming for somebody else. Start coming because somebody needs to be reached. Start coming because somebody needs to be ministered to. Start coming because Jesus wants me to serve. And when you do that, you're going to find connection like you've never found before. And you're going to find joy and happiness like you never found before. So Jesus lets us know that hope spreads through his purpose. His purpose is go, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other, words, in other words, we're to share the gospel. We're to teach them the word of God. We're to make disciples. We're to baptize them. Finally, hope grows by the presence of Jesus. This has been a very preachery kind of outline today, uh, using H and P a lot. Uh, hope uh, comes from the power of Jesus. Hope rests in the person of Jesus. Hope spreads through the purpose of Jesus. And hope grows by the presence of Jesus. Let me just leave you with this thought, and this should be a comforting thought to you. Jesus said, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always. How much? Always. When? Always. When you go through the valley? Always. When you're on the mountaintop, always. When you're discouraged and depressed, always. When you lose your job, always. It doesn't matter what you're going through. He is always, always with you. And that's my challenge to you today, to rest in that hope. Hope comes through Jesus. His power, his person, his purpose, and his presence. He promises always to be with you. Now, today, at the end of the message, I really want to ask you two things. Number one, what has God said to you today? I want you to think about that question. Maybe God's spoken to you about getting involved, going through the next step class, becoming a member, stop sitting on the sidelines. Maybe he spoke to you about something else. What what has he spoken to you about today? And number two is this. Um, the fact is Jesus always calls us to salvation he always calls us to salvation do you need to be saved today you say well yes that's what I need today I need Jesus those of you watching online listen closely today if you pray to receive Jesus Christ please click the button at the bottom of the page so that we can know that you prayed to receive Christ and we can follow up with you for those of you in the room today that need Jesus listen closely I want you to ask him to save you. Believe, repent and believe. Agree with God and believe. Trust him. Trust what Jesus did on the cross. Not your works, not coming to church, but you trust him. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, you may say something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God and that you died on the cross for me. And I believe you resurrected from the grave. And I'm praying right now to ask you to be my savior. And if you'll pray that prayer today, God promises that he will save you. He said, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you'd like more information about that, I'm going to, at the end of the service, be standing on the other side of that wall. And I want you to come by and let me know that you prayed to receive Christ. And I want you to take one of those cards and fill it out today. So uh, that next step card, Justin's going to come in a moment and tell us about next steps. But I want you to do it today. Do it today. Don't wait. Don't let the devil get a victory in your life. Do it today. So I got to go to lunch. Do it today. You'll be glad that you did. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.